Yes. Yes. Uh, you, you nailed it. You know, it's funny because over, you know, over a decade ago when we introduced marketing automation for small businesses, um, it was really kind of a new thing. It's funny. I, I talk about this and I say, you know, we, I remember sitting around the fire at an executive offsite and we were saying, what do we name this thing that we've created? You know, it's cause it's, cause it was CRM, but it was automation and it was really like, there was so much more to it. And there wasn't a phrase out marketing automation didn't exist. It was, you know, so we said, let's call it marketing automation. I think that's the closest descriptor of what it was. And it sounded so weird. Like it, it's funny today because it's so, you know, everybody knows what marketing automation is, or, you know, most people know what it is, but back then it was like, Oh, like, is that what it is? I mean, it sounded like, like naming a purple zebra or something. You know, it sounded so, <laughs> so weird to call it this. Welcome to the business ownership podcast brought to you by awareness strategies. Helping you navigate the waters between entrepreneurship and ownership. <laughs> hey there, peeps. This is Michelle Nedelec, and I'm super glad that you're here with us today because I'm here with my most amazing guest, Clay. Clay, thank you so much for being here with us today. Michelle, great to be here with you. Awesome. So give everybody the highlight of who you are and what you do for business. You bet. Clay Mass, co-founder and CEO of Keep. That's K-E-A-P. We are small business automation software. Uh, we help small businesses who are dealing with a lot of chaos and frustration and not the freedom that, uh, that they had hoped for, get order out of all of that, automate it and create growth, profit and efficiency. Nice. I love it. And we will totally get into the whole automation, growth, profits, all the fun stuff about business. But before we get into that, I want to kind of go backwards a little bit. How did you get into automation as your thing? Uh, well, I always have loved efficiency, but I will tell you, I was not, I'm, I'm not a techie. That's not what my background. Um, I had uh, two, my, my wife's two younger brothers were doing a custom software business and they kept asking me for advice. And I, I saw how smart they were. And I thought, you know, I should probably join them and we should work on building a business. And so I did that and I thought we would just build it up and then sell it. And a funny thing happened along the way. I absolutely fell in love with helping small businesses grow with automation. So it was a fam it's a family business. Uh, I started off helping thinking it would, I build it up and sell it, pay off my student debt. And <laughs> oh, that was 20 plus years ago. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, no, I love it too much. We can't let go of this one. That's awesome. So today now, who would you say that you're working with? Who's your ideal client or who comes to you most often? Yeah, six, seven and eight figure businesses that are, um, that, you know, they've got a business that's going, but it's, it's, uh, they're dealing with a lot of chaos. They're dealing with, uh, systems and processes that are not working very smoothly. There's a lot of, uh, you know, the pace of small business and the imbalance of business and life can make it a little hard and frustrating as an entrepreneur, as we all know. And so, um, I would say our kind of the center of the bullseye would be a business that's got five or 10 employees doing a million a year. Um, but we have, you know, this, a lot of times our customers will start with us when they're at a hundred thousand and they'll grow with us till, you know, 10, 20 million. That's pretty, you know, pretty common for our customers to grow with, with, with us to that stage. Nice. So a lot of people use kind of automation as a buzzword, but, um, I, I have a special in on <laughs> what you guys do. So I'm <laughs> particularly do. biased towards this. Uh, I don't think anybody will be shocked to hear that on this. So talk to me about automation, the way you have it set up. What is it about when you walk into a business? What are you looking for as far as kind of chaos mayhem goes? And what are you looking to bring order to? Yeah. You know, it starts with the customer life cycle from the point that you first get to, you know, meet a prospect or lead through to the point they become a customer and then to the point that they become a raving fan. That's the customer life cycle from lead to client to raving fan. And along that journey, along that path, there are a lot of dropped balls, missteps, a lot of handoffs that, that, that break down and a lot of inefficiency that occurs. And where it becomes super acute and painful is if you're spending money to generate leads and they're, you're not getting the conversion rate you want. So there's very obvious telltale signs in marketing and sales automation. There's more, uh, less obvious, but very uh, costly dropped balls once, the, once you get the customer and you're trying to turn them into a raving fan. As you know, the profits of a business come from successful customers who give you reviews, referrals, and repeat, repeat business, the three R's I talk about all the time. And unfortunately, most small business owners work like crazy to get that customer, but then they don't do a great job of wowing that customer and, and generating the reviews, referrals, and repeat business. So we look 
simply put all along the customer journey and we see um, gaps and opportunities and that's kind of the customer facing side but then there's also an internal side where you have workflows and operations that if you don't have your checklist being handled in an automated way you get a lot of customer fires business owner gets pulled into lots of things that he or she doesn't need to be pulled into because the systems and processes just aren't running the way that they ought to. Well, I know once upon a time when I first got into business in like the eighties, it was, here's your lost leader and the real profit margins are in the back end and you have to nurture your clients. You have to take care of them. And mm -hmm. it was all very um, relationship based in more of the big businesses. Is that still kind of what's being taught in business or are people dropping the ball there and like what's going on as far yeah. as kind of the new face business? You know, I would say that 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 principle is still very much at play. And in small businesses, it happens quite a bit. You know, on the one hand, small business is very personal. So the relationship matters a lot. On the other hand, um, in small businesses, you know, we're usually short on resources, time and, you know, hours in the day, number of people we can put on projects. And so we have things that start to slip through the cracks and we get customers who are, you know, prize customers that end up feeling dropped, left, forgotten. And that's so unfortunate because that's, like I said, where all the, all the profit is. So it definitely happens, you know, that, that relationship building um, is, is a critical part of this whole thing. I mean, that customer journey that I described, you know, there's software called customer relationship management software to help you, uh, you know, not have those gaps. And, and that's at the heart of what we do at CRM software, but then applying automation and everywhere you can so that you can um, minimize drop balls, optimize your, your revenue, improve your relationships and, you know, grow profit and freedom. Nice. So one of the biggest questions I always get is how do you make automation of a customer service <laughs> process yeah. um, relationship wise that it's not coming across as canned or uh, stoic? Yeah, that it's such an awesome question. And it's probably, it's probably one of the most common reasons that entrepreneurs and, and small businesses don't put automation in place because they they know how important the personal touch is and it, and it brings them a lot of satisfaction and a lot of comfort and they differentiate from larger businesses in that way and totally understandable. Um, but as, as you know, the, the trick is to actually use automation in a very personalized way. And, and you can do that now. You can do that through, you know, a combination of automation and AI and the personal touch. It's, it's, you don't just turn everything over to a machine to do all of your, you know, communications and process op uh, um, operations for you. you. You actually design it and design that customer journey of what needs to happen now and then this and, and then that and then that, you know, and you go ahead and go through a, some people are more process oriented thinkers and it's natural for them to sort of flow chart out the customer experience. Most entrepreneurs and small businesses aren't, which is why they end up getting into the chaos. And that's where we come into play to help them design a customer journey in a way that, um, that is very personal to their customers. And, and, you know, our, our partners and consultants, like you and and many others, this is what we do. We we help people create a very personalized experience, but that is automated and efficient, so that you can scale it and, like I said, find profit and freedom. <laughs> Thanks. So I often tell people if you've had the same conversation three times with three different people, you probably need to record it and allow <laughs> yeah. people to have that conversation at yes. their convenience, not your yes, convenience. Exactly. That's probably the first place to start, if nothing right. else. <laughs> right. And, is and there I, a better way to look at it for businesses that just want something to make their life easier? You know what? Um, let's use a concrete example. Um, yeah. Let's say that you've got, because I, I love your point about if you're having the conversation three times, record it and let people hear it on their convene, at their convenience. Great example. Um, super common scenario where automation can bring, uh, you know, that's a, that's a super, that's a super good concrete example. And let's say, okay, What's a place where we see automation in almost every client, you know, customer we work with? It's in the lead conversion process. So you've generated a lead. You are working to convert that lead into a sale. Sometimes that, that lead conversion process is happening online. Sometimes it's happening through a series of phone conversations. But you can go look at your emails that you're sending and you can just, you know, your rule of three, are you having the conversation? Well, do you have the same emails that are happening over and over? That starts to tell you, oh, 
what's actually happening here is there are milestones in the customer journey when I'm trying to get them to go from point A to point B to point C. And there's certain communications and, and information exchange that needs to occur to move the person from A to B to C. So when you go look at your in your email outbox or you go or your email sent box or you think about the conversations that you're having over and over, it starts to reveal where that repetition is. And then it begins to to show you that there's actually a process at play here that if we automate it um, and we we can do that through automated email communications, you can do that through letters, you can do that through scripts that you that you provide to your um, team members that are. You know, you, you, you can do a number of things where now the customer is at their pace, to your point, is moving through a buying process going from lead to sale, whether that's happening online or in person over phone calls. One of my favorite aspects of working with Keep was the internal implications that it had on a business, whereby for the what seemed like the first time you could have sales and marketing and operations all having conversations at the table together. And it was the same conversation for the first. <laughs> yes, yes, uh, you you nailed it. You know, it's funny because over, you know, over a decade ago, when we introduced marketing automation for small businesses, um, it was really kind of a new thing. It's funny. I, I talk about this and I say, you know, we, I remember sitting around the fire at an executive offsite and we were saying, what do we name this thing that we've created? You know, it's cause it's, cause it was CRM, but it was automation and it was really like, there was so much more to it. And there wasn't a phrase out marketing automation didn't exist. It was, you know, so we said, let's call it marketing automation. I think that's the closest descriptor of what it was. And it sounded so weird. Like, it's funny today because it's so, you know, everybody knows what marketing automation is, or, you know, most people know what it is, but back then it was like, oh, like, is that what it is? I mean, it sounded like, like naming a purple zebra or something, you know, it sounded so, <laughs> so weird to call it this, but we started calling it that we said marketing automation for small businesses. And, and yet the interesting thing that happened over the following decade was, yes, it is about marketing automation, but it was also about sales automation. And then you just hit right on it. It's funny because it's almost like over this past year, you were hearing what we were saying. We, we said, you know, Almost. We're, 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 we're selling it short when we just say it's marketing automation, sales automation, it's operations. It's actually the entire process that you are taking customers through. And then the internal implications that you just described so that when something happens with the customer, um, you know, the, the, the operations person, the front desk person, the, you know, the, 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 the technical leader, everybody knows kind of what's happening and knows what to do when. And it and when you have automation in place, it essentially takes your SOPs, your checklist that you use, and it automates them and it can ha it can basically um, keep everybody on the same page so that the customer gets the right experience, there's efficiency internally, and the business owner doesn't get pulled in to save the day and put out fires. <laughs> I, so when it comes to kind of the capacities of keep. I know that to us, it was kind of our magic wand because anytime an entrepreneur said, I, I want to do this, which they always do. Yes. <laughs> so yes. It was like, we can always figure out a way to do it. Right. And as other, as competition was coming in, they tried to do it, but I don't think they do it anywhere near as close, uh, let alone like marketing says they do it, but when it comes down to <laughs> hitting yes. the keyboard, it's like, no, that's not really what's right. going on here. And right. it's, you're not really going to get what you want. Can you give us some examples of what um, it's capable of that people are overlooking? Yeah, um, it's such a such a great point. I, I appreciate that. Uh, you know, there, there's billing automation in very sophisticated ways so that you can actually um, set up all kinds of programs, pricing, collections, payment plans, um, and automate all of that so that you're, you know, you're, you're providing flexibility to your customers that works for them. And, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times I've had customers that said, man, we we're able to come up with new products and new services all the time because it's so flexible on how we can charge it and bill it and put all of that on autopilot. Um, you know, Cut client offboarding, you know, none of us likes to lose a client, but what, when you're dealing with a client that's, that's leaving, that can be a very laborious time consuming process. You don't get it right. Customers very frustrated being able to automate all of that so that every step in the process, turn this off, turn this on, change this, move the move, turn off this thing. You know, it, there's, there's things that you 
normally have to have a bunch of manual process to do that, several different systems to put that together. Whereas with Keep, because it's your sales, your marketing, your client fulfillment, your operations, it's all of that. You can do all of that, all of that automation. And when you say other competitors have tried to do it, well, it's because they really usually just have the marketing automation part or the CM, CRM part. They don't really have the whole, the whole suite of automation. And so it becomes very difficult to do some of the types of things I just described. How do you handle refunds? How do you handle returns? How do you handle the onboarding of a new client or the onboarding of a new employee for that matter? You know, anything that any process, like I, as you know, if you can flow chart it, you can automate it with keep. And so the ability to that, that flexibility and the, the robust um, automation builder that we created uh, that has just been built and increased in its power and capability over time. That's really the crown jewel of our product is that automation builder. And it can be applied to automate anything across your business. And I, I can't tell you how fun it is for me when I have customers that say, oh my gosh, I realize I can do this. And now I can do this. And I've had this idea and I can do this. And like you said, <laughs> entrepreneurs have these ideas and they're like, could we do that? You know, I was just at a, at a, a customer a couple of weeks ago and two of them were talking and he's more of the idea creator guy and she's more of the implementer automator in keep. And so he'll come with something, look at her. Can we do this? And she says, and she said this, she goes, I had to turn on my brain that's, that speaks in keep. And I had to say, yeah, I, I can do that. Yeah, we, we can do it. Yes. Uh, yeah, we can do that. So anyway, I, I love the point you make. It's super robust. It's super powerful. And it's, that's why it's so like incredible for a business that's going from seven figures to eight figures, because a lot of times you're having to go stitch together a bunch of different platforms to do this in the absence. And it costs, it's very expensive. And, um, there's, there's, you know, we're, we really are, I know I'm biased, but we really are the, the most powerful, robust automation platform for growing small businesses. Absolutely. And I often tell people it's, we love to come into a business when they have what I like to call Frankenware put in place. So they have a little bit of software here, a little bit there, a little bit there, and they're trying to, you know, pump yeah. life into it. <laughs> just, yeah. <laughs> just breathe. It's a lot It's supposed to work. And it's like, <laughs> it's how do you do that? Then manually. I'm like, right. then it's not working. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> that will break down. Yes. Yes. Well said. Uh, love it. So have you noticed that there's kind of, you were mentioning building this, the seven figure businesses, and we've worked with eight figure businesses with Keep to be able to bring their processes together. Are there companies that are um, ideally fit for Keep that, yeah, they just didn't know about it. They haven't heard about it. They didn't realize that was an option for them. Like, who is it kind of best positioned for? Yeah, um, more commonly, our customers are service businesses um, across all different industries. Um, but we have, you know, we have retail business, product businesses, but that's that's the lesser portion of our customer base. It's more service businesses, virtually any service business, in particular, if the relationship building is important. And that means that, you have high high potential lifetime value, um, high ticket item that you're selling. Um, that's that's where the most common uh, customer, you know, where, where we're most successful with customers. Not to say we don't have customers that have low ticket item or they're purely online, or but where re relationship is really important and the lifetime value is high and there's a high ticket item and and the the details matter. You know, you you where you you get real egg on your face if you don't handle something or real loss that's super frustrating. You know, when, when that pain of having a customer that ends up buying a competitor's product because they didn't realize, you know, they bought it product X or, you know, service X from you and they didn't realize you offered Z, you know, and so they go to somebody else because you just weren't building that relationship. And so where the relationship's really valuable and, uh, you know, a lot of times in service business, like I said, and high ticket item. So when it comes to the struggles that might somebody might be having in their business, uh, obstacles that they're facing on a regular basis, somebody listening to this, looking at the chaos that they've created in their business, yeah. what are they looking at? What are those stumbling blocks that they have? And they're thinking, oh my God, Clay, I need you guys so badly. Yeah. Um, lead slipping through the cracks is one of the most common things. So you're just not getting, and you know, you're not getting the yield out of any of your, out of your marketing investments, whether that's time that you're investing, dollars that you're investing, but you're, you're just not getting good good yield out of that. Um, your conversion rates are kind of hit and miss. Um, 
if your sales and marketing efforts tend to be kind of on again, off again, you know, you, they're sort of like, okay, we need to really make a big push right now. You know, if you've got that kind of emergency that's, that's coming up, it's because you don't have your sales and marketing on autopilot to the extent that you could, um, on the, you know, on the customer side, when, when you have un unhappy customers because the experience didn't go the way that they expected, uh, when you have, um, handoffs that are not happening the right way. So you've got internal teams that are internal team members that are frustrated and let's face it in small business, you know, everybody on the team's wearing multiple hats usually. And so, uh, it's easy to drop the ball, but you're, you're dropping the ball with customers. You're, you're, you've got a little bit of finger pointing going on internally. Um, you know, I've, I've referenced this a few times, but when, when the business owner has got to come in and be the hero, you know, it, when, if you're at 10 employees is kind of this magic thing that we find that the business owner can kind of get it to that point and everybody's reporting to the business owner. Maybe there's a, you know, a, a, a team lead or two, but you get to the point where, uh, the business starts to plateau because the business owner is the bottleneck and the business owner starts to get, um, you know, sometimes the business owner brings it on herself himself, but with a little bit of hero syndrome and kind of finds their value in being the one that comes in and saves the day. And that's where their value is created early in the business. And so sometimes they perpetuate it, but, but the, you want to make the system, the hero, you want to make the, you know, you want to make the automation, the thing that enables everybody to look like a hero, every member of the team to look like a hero. And so if you're feeling those pains, if you're feeling like you're overwhelmed, it's not, you know, you're not, a lot of times they'll, they'll see that, gosh, I was making more money when it was three of us than it is, you know, I was taking home more when it was three of us. Now the business is doing a million, but I'm taking home less than when we had three people, you know, maybe I should just go back to that. You know, if you're having those kinds of, Mm, you know, longing for the the earlier days kind of thing. It's because your process and systems haven't evolved the way they need to. And, um, you know, the other telltale sign is just the imbalance of work and life. And it, you know, it, they're just not enough hours in the day and you're, you're hearing it from your spouse. You're hearing it from friends and loved ones. Oh, wow. You're here. What do we do? To, you know, what do we do to get your, you know, for have you graces with your presence? And it's like, hey, yeah, my business is, you know, busy. <laughs> so, so those kinds of things relation, you know, health sometimes is starting to call, you know, have problems. And sometimes the business owners get into that dark place where they're like, I don't even know why I'm doing this anymore. Like, should I, you know, they, they start to romanticize the idea of selling, getting out. I, you know, this is just not what I thought it would be. Um, and sometimes it's so odd because they'll be on this, on the outside, they look like they're really successful because they've gotten past the struggle days and, you know, friends and family are no longer worried about them. And, you know, um, they, so it looks like things are better, but, but they're feeling the weight of it as, as the business owner. And so, you know, those are just some of the things team members are feeling frustrated, like they're being asked to do too much with, you know, not enough and, and always needing to pull a rabbit out of the hat to make things work. Those are, those are just some of the things that come up as um, clear indications that the chaos is sapping the, the, you know, profit, freedom, and joy out of the business. Awesome. So I know there are a ton of listeners that are can relate to this. And peeps, we are going to come back in a minute. I'm going to ask Clay about his Cinderella story because I know he has books and books published <laughs> every year with the stories of their Cinderella oh, stories in them. So I know you've got a ton to choose from. And I also know that people can relate to that frustration of I have 10 employees. I'm either going to hit a breaking point or I'm going to blow through this. And we're going to talk about what it takes to be able to not only blow through it, but blow through it with ease and grace so that it doesn't feel like it's a painful yes. ordeal to be able to transition to that. So hang yes. on, we'll be right back. Are you running a business over seven figures but still struggling with technology headaches? Pay attention, you do not want to miss this offer. This podcast episode is brought to you by Awareness Strategies, who is offering a custom-built digital adoption roadmap for anyone running a business over seven figures who's wanting to grow their business in the next five years. And it's not just a roadmap, they offer full implementation as well. If that scares the out of you, check out awarenessstrategies.com forward slash roadmap for more details today. The link's in the show's notes. Don't regret not doing this, do it now. That's awarenessstrategies.com slash roadmap. We are back and I'm super excited to hear about one of your favorite Cinderella stories. You know what, I'm going to tell you two quickly. The first nice. one is one that is um, more of the surprise, I suppose. Um, this is a story about a customer named Mike Callahan, who was um, building a, a, a landscaping business. Um, 
and was super successful and things were going great and uh, got married and the business was very demanding and started to put pressure on the relationship. And on Valentine's day, he came home and his, his wife said, I'm done. Can't do this. Business is too much. Uh, that's your real mistress. And I can't, you know, you're, that's your real, your, your real wife is your business is your mistress. And I can't do this. And uh, unfortunately they got divorced. Uh, oh. Sounds pretty awful. But the reality is that happens sometimes because the business becomes so much. And he was devastated because he was successful. His family and friends all thought, man, you are living your best life. Things are going great. And he looked at it and said, there's got to be a better way. And um, he found Keep and he began to discover what it is to automate the customer life cycle from lead to client to raving fan and began to put automation in place little by little. As you know, this isn't something you just do. Hey, let's just go try this for a week. You build this out over time and you build more and more automation. And he did that. And he built a business that was more successful than the one he hit. He, by the way, he sold off his old business and said, you know what? I, I, can't, I can't do that. And he built a business that created um, also, by the way, in the lands in landscaping space, but created the kind of freedom that he really wanted and enabled him to live a different lifestyle. Got remarried. Uh, he now teaches... Um, landscapers, how to run their business with automation. He's a partner with Keep now, and they they've they have created a a platform for those landscaping businesses using our automation, and that's one that I just I love because it's because it shows how the automa automation is the great game changer. It puts more hours in your day. It gets you out of the trading hours for dollars business and enables you to actually find the freedom that you wanted when you started your business in the first place. So that's the first one. Nice. That's uh, awesome. And what's the second one? <laughs> second one, husband and wife team who were um, running a nice little lifestyle business. Uh, they were, they were doing pretty well. They decided they, they, they found out about keep, they decided, you know what, let's, let's put some of this automation in place, particularly on the marketing and sales side. Um, and they, uh, they put the, they, they started to put automation in place, uh, worked with one of our partners and with us, uh, with our software and, uh, things were going really well. The business uh, roughly doubled over the following, you know, they'd been running the business for several years and it kind of was slowly growing, but when they put automation in place, the business roughly doubled. Um, they, they were, they only, all the only labor that they added was their part-time, a part-time labor from their college student daughter. Um, and so the profit went up dramatically and things were going great. And then she got hospitalized and was, down and out for over a month in the hospital. And while she was in the hospital, you can imagine as a husband and wife team, uh, what that would mean. She was the person that handled all of the client fulfillment as well as the, the, the marketing. And, um, she told us that while she was in the, in the, in, in the hospital, revenue stayed the same clients were getting taken care of all the automation was working for her. And the business was just fine because of the automation that they had created. She said, we never could have done that without keep because um, with, without the, the, the system running on its own, um, she would have been, you know, critical to making the whole thing work. So I, I love those two stories because both translate into the lifestyle and freedom that ultimately happen when, when business owners for, for business owners and their employees, when they put automation in place. Well, you have hit so many key points that I love to talk about in business because I think that business is an, is the external way that people or individuals self-actualize. So it's mm. not just a business. It's not just an enterprise. It is a personification of, yeah. of who they are, an external you know entity, an expression of these people. And when something happens to us, within our family, it hits our business. And if we don't have the strength and the systems and the support in place, you know, everything crumbles and, and we definitely don't want that. I, and, I love that you said that and particularly the phrase of self-actualize because that's the top tier of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And in my book, Conquer the Chaos, I, I call out the, the entrepreneur's um, hierarchy and the entrepreneur's hierarchy is all about freedom, but the levels are, um, money and then time and then control 
then impact, and then ultimately that that freedom we're after. But you're right. That's that's what it looks like for entrepreneurs. They're self-actualizing by achieving that impact and freedom. Um, but you know, just like if, with Maslow, you first have to get to shelter and food, and you know, you, you got to get the money and the time part at the at the base of the of the entrepreneur's hierarchy. Right. Well, we will definitely have to have a whole other conversation on that because I'm doing hours for that one. I love when, it. When it comes to kind of the systems and automating, I think people have a kind of skewed opinion of the word automate for starters. And I think it, a recent, the most recent one that I think everybody knows about is E-Myth and Michael Gerber and talking about how you have to have the systems in place. You have to right. think of your business kind of as, if not a franchise, then you know, your SOPs in place, how do you replace yourself as soon as possible? But I think in so many ways, in so many businesses that I've seen, that is one of the precipices to go from those kind of 10 employees to what I call business ownership, getting out of the the day-to-day -day operations and having a business that you own and it runs on its own. It's not necessarily that you're in it on right. a day-to-day -day business right. or on a day-to-day -day basis. So kind of how do you see the importance of keep being able to help businesses to transition through that um through <laughs> that what i and that yeah. gnarly, those gnarly twists at the end of those 10 employees going okay do i boom or bust and you know is it hell and chaos or what, right, what do i right. have looking forward to yeah it, you know you, you've said it really well it's you have to work on the business and you need systems to to run the business for you now in in larger companies they use systems and they throw a lot of employees at it in small business you can't afford to throw employees at it you've got to get a system and you know one of my favorite things is when customers tell us keeps my best employee it doesn't call in sick it doesn't you know <laughs> it, it works every time I, it's i don't have to pay it nearly as much as i pay my employees but but that really is you you've got to have you can either put technology to work for you or labor to work for you. And in small business, you want to use technology as much as possible. And so we just see it as the, as the technology that helps our, you know, helps entrepreneurs to grow that business in an efficient way. Now, what I would say is just like Michael Gerber calls out very clearly the distinction between, between working on the business and working in the business, that's really what you're doing with systems. You're working on the systems that enable the business to run without you being in there doing it. You know, I love Michael doing it, doing it, doing it, as he says, right. <laughs> you get, you put, you work on the system to run it for you. And that's where keep comes into play. And I, you know, I, I've told people many times, you know, when entrepreneurs say, well, how do I actually do this? How do I make this transition from working in the business to working on the business? And I say, you start off with a two hour block every week and you're going to, and you go someplace where you can get away from all of the, distractions, fires, magnetic pull of the business. And you can just go work on the business and you, uh, you, you do that for two hours. And a lot of times it starts with, so, okay, well, what, where's something that's broken? And a lot of times it's in lead conversion. It's the best place to start because in that lead conversion process, you're, you're lose. It's where you can generate money to get the business working more effectively. So you just go work on your marketing, your lead conversion for two hours a week. And then you try to turn it up to four hours and then six hours, and then a whole day. And you just get to the point where gradually you spend more time, if not all of your time working on the business instead of in the business. That is where all of the leverage and all the power comes. And marketing and automation are the place to start if you want to make that transition from in the business to on the business. I love when you said that it's working on the systems, because a lot of times, I see CEOs in their business going, oh, well, this is a sales decision. This is a marketing decision. I'm like, mm, this is a business decision. Mm -hmm, <laughs> you need mm -hmm. to make those decisions. Yes. And then they will take those that lead and implement it in whatever direction you want. But you can't expect your VP of sales or your VP of marketing to be spearheading where right. the company is going to go. And if you do, <laughs> it's like, right. you got to rethink your org chart. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. They are business decisions. That's, a, that's exactly right. And, and, you know, to your point about automation, sometimes people misunderstand it. And I say, well, start on marketing automation. Here's an easier way to say it. Start on marketing, decide when you get a lead, what's step one, what's step two, what's step three, step four, step five, in order to turn that lead into a customer, lay out those steps. Now, what pieces of information and communication need to occur, write those things out. What you're doing is you're building a process 
you're building a lead conversion system that you can then put into software to automatically deliver all of those steps so that now you don't have to put man hours behind it. You don't have to do it yourself. That's where you start to create hours in the day. That's where you start to be able to put more and more into working on the business instead of in the business. So whether, you know, in your example, whether that's a, you know, it looks like a sales decision or a marketing decision, it, it, it's really a business decision. You're trying to improve the efficiency of the business. And that requires that you sit down and you go, okay, well, what needs to happen first? And then this, and then this, and then this, and you just work through a process. Someone like you, who's very process oriented, it comes naturally. Someone like me who thinks automation, it comes pretty naturally. Um, for most listeners, it's, uh, it's what? not their first language. Yeah. <laughs> and I get that. So I hear the words happen? you're saying. I yes. have no idea what they mean. <laughs> right. right. So you wrote a book on this and tell us more about the book and kind of who it's for and, and yeah. what it covers. Yeah. You know, um, 14 years ago, my co-founder and I wrote the book, Conquer the Chaos, How to Grow a Successful Small Business Without Going Crazy. And <laughs> we really introduced the world to marketing automation through that book. And um, last year, I, I decided, you know what, as we're bringing small business automation to the market, it's time for a refresh of Conquer the Chaos. And um, earlier this year, I decided, okay, I started working. I went to Scott and I said, hey, I, I want to do this. He's like, yeah, I agree. I think it's time. We've done so much with the product. There's so much different, like the market's ready for this. The world has changed. AI, you know, and on and on and on. And I said, okay, well, let's do this. And he goes, we started talking about it. And he's like, you know, why don't I stay focused on product and you do it? <laughs> so, so I said, <laughs> this all right. sounds like a you issue. Yes. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> and I said, I said, you know what? It probably will be easier to do it this way. And so, and it actually was, but I'll tell you what, I thought it was going to be like a 20% rev revision. It, it was 90%, you know, I mean, it's wow. just so much, so much has changed in 14 years. Right. And what we do for small businesses with automation and what small businesses are capable of doing now versus, you know, nearly a decade and a half ago. So long story short, the book is still conquer the chaos, but it's the six keys to success for entrepreneurs. And it's, it really turned into an opportunity for me to just pour into entrepreneurs, six, seven, eight figure entrepreneurs, even, even brand new businesses, um, what I've seen as the keys to success across hundreds of thousands of small businesses that we've been fortunate to work with for now over two decades. And um, just recognizing that there's a personal side to it and a business side to it. So there are three three personal keys. They are mindset, life vision, and rhythm of execution. And there are three business keys, strategy, which is heavily into the customer strategy stuff we're talking about, um, automation, not surprising, and leadership. So those are the six keys. Um, you know, it's, it's been, I can't tell you, uh, how, uh, it's been a very interesting experience writing it. I, 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 it turned into being like, I just wanted to, you know, give the gift of, um, experience of what I've seen back to entrepreneurs and, and, um, help them to be successful. It kind of became a, a labor of love and just a total passion project, but, but I love it. I'm really excited for it to get, it comes out March 6th. Riley's the publisher. Um, people can get it on pre-sale uh, on Amazon pre but in print by pre-sale now. Um, there's a bunch of you know tools and stuff that go along with it, but it's been really, really fun to do. And I I love the entrepreneur and the journey they go through, and I want to spare them of the chaos and the dark side that unfortunately sometimes uh is too often the case. Well, regardless of when somebody's listening to this, because it might be 2040 by the time somebody's yes. listening to this, we never know. Um but we will, of course, have all of Clay's links in the show notes. But go ahead. And do you know what the um, URL is going to be for to get the book? Um, oh, there you go. Yeah, they can go to conquerthechaosbook.com. Nice. So, again, we'll have that link in the show notes. Did want to talk to you. You hit on a couple of things, especially the changes that have happened in the last 15 years or so. Do you think there's a difference between when you started your company and being able to build that up to, <laughs> I was going to say the monstrosity that it is, the megalith <laughs> that it is? Uh, and somebody that's kind of starting out today and wants to be able to build, you know, a modest build business for themselves, they're going, Hey, I want to build a seven figure business, or they want to build a, you know, eight, nine figure business. Right. A lot of things are different. Uh, a lot of things are the same. 
you know, certainly the way we go about acquiring customers is just different today with, you know, online, social media, just podcasts. I mean, for, I mean, there's just so many different things that you just couldn't even dream of 15 years ago. So uh, there's many things that are different, particularly in, in marketing, sales, customer acquisition. But in terms of business process, um, keys to success, you know, some of the just what it takes for entrepreneurs to push through all of the difficulty and challenge and not lose their souls in the process of building a business. You know, those things are the same. They, they really haven't changed too much. Um, you know, but I, I certainly just love the process of building. I talk in the book about the stages of small business growth and they tend to change on the ones and threes of revenue at a hundred thousand at 300,000, a million, 1 million, 3 million, 10 million, 30 million, so on. And, and there's just, you know, tried and true things that need to occur in order to move past from stage to stage. I talk about that in the book. Um, so, you know, there's some things that are different. Some things are the same. Uh, to me, I just have passion around small business growth. To me, it's the, just the most fun thing. You, know, you talked about the self-actualization. It's also just an amazing lab to practice and learn to become a better human being through entrepreneurship. And, and you know, I, I love that, that personal development aspect of it. So is there any advice that you would give somebody that's planning on building a business and they're going, yeah, I want business ownership. I want a business that runs without me and I'm just starting up. Is there any advice that you would give them and go, okay, I did that. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say trying to do it yourself. Um, probably one of the biggest things, you know, the rugged individualism that drives someone to start a business and get some measure of success early on is also the thing that prevents them from growing it more and um, sort of learning to relinquish control on the right things while holding control on the right things. You know, that, that there's a, there's a trick there. And a lot of times the rugged individualism sort of holds us back and causes us to not partner with people, to not hire the talent that we need, uh, to hold the cards too closely to our vest instead of co-creating something bigger and better with a team. Um, I think those are the, th that, that sort of um, putting on a cape and doing it all yourself is, is, uh, has a certain amount of ego appeal to it, but it actually holds back more businesses than anything else, in my opinion. I love it. So I know people are going to want to get, or to, to get more from you, answer all tons of questions that they have. How do they start their journey with you? Yeah, they can definitely go to, um, conquer the chaos book.com to get the book. And there's other resources there and they can learn more about keep there. They can go to keep.com K E A P.com. Uh, and by the way, the reason we call it keep is it's all about the grit and tenacity of entrepreneurs. Keep going, keep serving, keep growing. Um, that's, that's why it's keep, but yeah, keep.com or conquer the chaos book.com. Either one's great. Love it. We will, of course, have all of Clay's notes in the show links or links in the show notes. So go ahead and scroll down and open up in a new browser because we're not done yet. You know how this goes. So Clay, I get to ask <laughs> you, at what point in life did you know that you were especially kind of crazy enough to think that you could become an entrepreneur? You know, I always, when I was a little kid, you know, I just loved, I, I did all kinds of things from selling marbles and pencils on the playground to going door to door to sell holiday wrapping paper and gingerbread houses and having a paper route. I mean, I just, I, I grew up in a family where we knew if you want something, you got to go work and make money in order to do it. And by the way, you're not going to make money from me and you know mom and dad. So go find a way to actually make money in the world and create real value. Uh, and um, I just, I just loved it. You know, I just saw how that, that, how the world works that way. And I looked around and saw friends and family members that were building a great business and just knew I wanted to do that. Then I went down the school path, got deep into learn, you know, higher education and then came back around to entrepreneurship and so glad I did. Nice. Well, we are so glad you did as well. So <laughs> you have been absolutely awesome. Any last words for our peeps? No, you know, Michelle, thanks so much. I just, uh, to the people out there that are feeling that chaos and feeling the frustration, know that there is a better way. There really is. And you don't have to trade hours for dollars. You don't have to sacrifice your soul for the good of the business. You don't have to um, make trade-offs and regrets that sometimes entrepreneurs end up thinking they have to make. It doesn't, it doesn't really need to be that way. You can put automation in place and it, it is the great game changer for small businesses. Love it. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. And I know how valuable it is. Thank you. Great to be here with you. Awesome. Peeps, thank you for being here with us today. Be sure to subscribe to the show and share it with your friends. We love helping entrepreneurs grow. 
Are you running a business over seven figures but still struggling with technology headaches? Pay attention, you do not want to miss this offer. This podcast episode is brought to you by Awareness Strategies, who is offering a custom-built digital adoption roadmap for anyone running a business over seven figures who's wanting to grow their business in the next five years. And it's not just a roadmap, they offer full implementation as well. If that scares the out of you, check out awarenessstrategies.com forward slash roadmap for more details today. The link's in the show's notes. Don't regret not doing this. Do it now. That's awarenessstrategies.com slash roadmap.